Hello, wonderful to see you. Um, as you may have noticed, we were not here for a couple of Sundays. Um, it was the first time in... How old are you, Ryan? <laughs> first time in about 15 years that Marina and I, just the two of us without the kids, have been away. So it was long overdue, and we had a wonderful, wonderful time. Seems like a dream. Uh, just to be um, together and unplugged, so so it was beautiful. But we we're happy to be back. And um, I saw Thelma and Phil this morning, and and Thelma said, "Oh, we missed you. It's so wonderful to see you this morning." And and Phil said, "Oh, you came back." <laughs> so anyway, we 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 received that. Thank you. <laughs> No, but really, we're, we're so blessed to be here and, uh, and to be gathered here this morning in faith and expectation before our God. And he is so faithful and so personal and to speak a word in season to our hearts. And we, we've learned and we are learning to have that expectation from, from God. He's, he's amazing. So let's, uh, we'll go to the word together just to quick uh, reflection on Christianity Explored, which has been um, a wonderful focus and outreach and ministry for us as a church these past uh, few weeks. We're about halfway through now. It's not too late if any of you would like to come along on a Tuesday night, uh, 6.30 here. And um, there's such rich times. The, the, the course itself gives us a, a, a skeleton uh, form to follow. Um, but we have question and answer time, and it's wonderful. So Tuesday, 6.30, feel free uh, to, to come along to that. I notice Penny's here. Good to see you, Penny. God bless you. Um, so let's turn to uh, Ezra, or in fact, I think the verses might come on, on the screen. Maybe we could um, uh, stand together for, the, for this reading. Could we stand together for that and turn uh, or look to the screens as we read Ezra Chapter 4. And uh, we'll be having communion together at the end of the service, so this message will also be preparing our hearts. So Ezra uh, 4, verse uh, 24. And so the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased... And it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. And then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So, Father, we pray, just quicken us according to your word. By your spirit, we pray you'd speak to each person person here. Speak to our hearts and bless this assembly gathered in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's be seated together. Our reading was from Ezra to set the stage, but we're going to be in the book of Haggai today, which is one of those small minor prophets um, don't worry if you can't find it in the Bible. We'll have it up on the screen. But it is a bit tricky to find it. It's one of the 12 minor prophets. It's sadly one of those little neglected books in the Bible that many people have perhaps not heard much about or even read. It's just two chapters, but it is loaded. It is so rich, and the message is so wonderful for all of us. So this morning, we're going to open it. We're going to teach it. We're going to preach from it, and there'll be a blessing Um, for us uh, from this little book. It's wonderful to learn the Bible afresh together, isn't it? So, um, the book of Haggai. We can have that come up on the screen. And uh, while they're doing that, I'll just... um, We want to frame the book in its context. And you may remember... um, We have had some teachings from the book of Ezra, so I think a lot of this will... Uh, is beginning to come very familiar uh, to us, which is a wonderful thing. The context is important. Uh, this is the shortest book 
in the Old Testament after Obadiah. So it's very small, as we mentioned, just two chapters, and it has very concise messages from prophet, the prophet Haggai, which cut right to the core of the issue. Perhaps his ministry was only a few months in total, but it was a very crucial time. God brought him onto the scene with crucial messages uh, for the people of God just at the right time, and the results were amazing. There are certain books in the Old Testament that were given to encourage the remnant believers. There are eight of them altogether, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and of course these prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and also the Italian prophet Malachi. I'm just kidding, Malachi, Malachi, I'm just kidding. Those eight books were given for a purpose to encourage the remnant, to remind them who they were and what their purpose was. Because as we can see from their history and our own history, it's so easy for us to forget who we are and to forget our purpose. So the words of Haggai and the words of the Scriptures are so pertinent to quicken us again and again and again, bringing into focus our identity and our purpose. So we remember the context. Let's frame the book. We remember all the way back in the beginning, through Abraham, God brought together his chosen people. He delivered them from Egypt in the book of Exodus, and uh, after their wilderness wanderings, he brought them into the promised land under Joshua. About 400 years under the judges, about 400, 500 under the kings, And over that history, the prophets warning them that if they did not walk with God, there would be consequences. He would rip them up from out of the land and take them to captivity. And of course, that's what happened. 605 under Nebuchadnezzar, God's chosen people were taken from the promised land and scattered in the captivity. But God had not let them go. God had promised. God had made a covenant with the Hebrew word hesed, or his loving kindness, his steadfast love. He said, I will never let you go. There was discipline, there were consequences for their wayward ways, but he would never let them go. And sure enough, after 70 years, according to Jeremiah the prophet, the captivity ended. And it was by the decree of Cyrus. And when we look at the beginning of Ezra, you may remember 1-1 starts with Cyrus, the Persian king, giving a decree that all those in the captivity could return to their homelands and about a remnant of almost 50,000, which is a very small percentage, decided to leave Babylon and return back to Jerusalem with the purpose of building the temple. And the first thing they did was build an altar on the on the site of the ruins of the temple. You remember we had a message on that, to have an altar. You also remember they laid the foundation, and we had a message on that, having the right foundation as believers, as in Ezra chapter 3. And then in chapter 4, they had opposition. And every great work of God will have opposition. But we have a common enemy. And we see at the end of chapter 4, and this is the reading we just had, the work ceased. Which is quite something to us when we understand the context. The faithfulness of God finally bringing them to the land, back from captivity, the remnant, for the purpose of building the temple, and yet there was opposition and the work ceased. We had a message on that, never to let the work of God cease in our own lives or in the church. But it did stop for 15 years, from about 535 to about 520 BC. For those 15, 16 years, the foundation of the temple lay waste. It began to get overgrown. People began to get busy with their lives and have children and start businesses and mow their lawn and everything else that life involves. And they forgot. They forgot their identity and their purpose and the calling of God and why they had been brought back to Jerusalem. 
And of course, after that verse, the work ceased in 424, we read the next verse in 5.1, and then the prophets Haggai and Zechariah began to preach. Oh, it's a wonderful verse. For the result was God stirred the hearts of the leaders and the people, and they began to remember, and things came into focus again. And there was a living faith reborn in their hearts and a return back to the foundation to build. It's a glorious story of redemption and victory. We read in Haggai 1 here in this verse, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. Again, perhaps he only was preaching or ministering or prophesying for three months. Um, If we read the first verse of Zechariah, who was his contemporary, the younger of the two, it says in the eighth month, Zechariah began to preach. So they were only, they were contemporaries a couple of months apart. And through these two prophets, God did a great work. We read the verse in the beginning of Ezra 5. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to the Jews in Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who was over them. God was over them. God was for them. God was with them. Haggai was very aware of the divine origin of his message. In fact, 25 times, which is an incredible amount of times in just two chapters, he refers to the divine origin of his message. He constantly uses terms like, and then the Lord said, or thus saith the Lord. 25 times. We see it here in one one. The word of the Lord came to Haggai. In verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts. Verse 3, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. Verse 5, thus said the Lord, thus said the Lord, all the way through. That wasn't insecurity on Haggai's part, but security. He was very sure that as a prophet, as a vessel, God would use him and God would speak to him. And in verse 13, it says, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message saying, I am with you, says the Lord, several times there. And the theme, of course, of his message is, it is time to build, which is the theme of our message this morning also. series of messages all about building the house, and what does it speak of for us? We know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. You are. As a born-again believer, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And collectively, as a church, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Timothy 3.15. And in 1 Peter 2.5, it says that we are individually living stones built up in a spiritual house. We are the spiritual temple of God today in the church age. So when we consider God building the house, it's just as Christ said, I will build my church that he is doing a work in each individual's life and collectively in the church. So now we go to Haggai 1.1, and we see here Haggai beginning to speak. And very simply, the word of the Lord came by Haggai to Zerubbabel. Every spiritual advance from Abraham all the way through to the book of Acts comes with a word from the Lord. It's when God is speaking. That's when hearts are revived. That's when lives are changed. That's when a vision is realized. That's when a work of any eternal value begins. It's when there is a word from the Lord. This is why as a church we love and value preaching and teaching, having an open Bible and learning the word of God together looking and believing, not for a work of men, but really for a work of God in our hearts, from the inside out. Spiritual advance comes by the Word of God. How can I have a fresh encounter with God unless He is speaking to me? Unless I expose myself, my heart, to the Word. If I withdraw 
and I don't either hear preaching or I don't open the Bible in my own life. It's just a matter of time before I will succumb to a natural life. It's not a question if, it's a question when. If you take a burning coal from the fire, it's just a matter of time, it will cool off. And the spiritual principle is the same, how much we need to have teaching and preaching and our own personal devotion where God can search and speak to our hearts and revive us again and again. For faith comes by hearing, Romans ten seventeen. So this was the time, the unction, the word from the Lord through the prophet to speak to the people. And first Haggai speaks to the leaders. He speaks to Zerubbabel, the governor, and he speaks to Joshua, the high priest. For there it must begin. Verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. See that? In these verses, we see the priorities of the people being exposed. Other things have begun to take priority. The temple lay neglected. We see the opposite principle in David's heart. Do you remember? When one day, when David is in his palace and on his throne, David said, how is it that I live in this palace and God dwells in a tent? I will build him a house. What a wonderful desire. It wasn't to be David or it wasn't to be at that time that it would happen. It was through Solomon. But nevertheless, Nathan the prophet said, oh, that's a wonderful thing that's in your heart, David. But here we see the opposite in the heart of the remnant. They said, it is not time. God had something to say to them. What time is it then? It's a good question. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it in our hearts and on our calendar, our priorities, the focus, what the natural man says and what God says often can be very different. Verse 3, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Oh, I love that simple verse. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying. We don't believe in prophets today in the same way that they were in the Old Testament. We don't believe that there can be further inspiration or anything added to the Bible. We don't believe in... in, uh, prophesying the future in the same way that these Old Testament prophets did. But the principle of a man being a messenger, opening the word, it's wonderful to have a faith expectation in that. Paul commended the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. He said, I commend you that when you hear the word of God, you hear it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, what? The word of God. And then he says, which works in you effectually to everyone who believes. If we are believing, it says the word of God works in us effectually. It's why I'm a preacher. Not because I believe I'm a great speaker, but because I believe the word of God with the spirit of God can touch and change lives. And so he does. Believe in preaching the word and the Holy Spirit will do his work. In verse 4, God asks this question, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple lies in ruins? Now, of course, there was nothing wrong with them having these paneled houses, spoke of well-fitted luxury houses they were beginning to build. There was nothing wrong with that. But in the context, in the calling, in the timing, with the foundation laid waste, it was, op- it was in opposition to what God had called them to do. They had lost sight. And we also can neglect our relationship with God. We understand that. We understand how we can lose sight. It's why we've learned certain spiritual disciplines in our life, to draw near and to hear and to come with a a heart of full assurance, looking to God and saying, Oh God, here I am. I know so easily I can stray like a lost sheep. Would you find me again? Would you quicken me again? Would you set me right again? 
How faithfully he does that. Verse 5. Now therefore, says the Lord, consider your ways. Consider your ways. This means to hit the pause button. Time out. Just throw that in for Dom. Time out. Consider. Stop. Pause. Give your heart and mind. Let God search your heart. So good for us to do that. And oh, may the, may the Word and the Spirit and the pulpit always bring us to that place of considering our ways, not in an introspection that we are searching our own hearts, but that God would be searching our hearts. And then he says this, verse 6, You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages and puts it into a bag with holes. Consider your ways. Hit the pause button and think about there are certain divine principles in play that can affect a person's life. And he asked them to consider what's happening. They were working, but they weren't seeing the fruit of it. They were drinking, metaphorically speaking, and, and still thirsty, eating and still hungry. It says they would work and put the money in their pockets, but the pockets had holes. They would try and hold on to it, and it was disappearing. And God said, maybe you need to look up. Maybe you need to consider your ways. He's saying, perhaps, the principle here is perhaps God can be in that that there is a principle of sowing and reaping, of seeking and finding, of having God's blessing on my life or withheld from my life. It's possible. God implies that he had short-circuited their efforts, and that's out of love and grace. God does not want us to settle for less. He doesn't want us to be prospering without him because he loves us too much. He doesn't want us to be temporally, superficially satisfied with with life without him. But he wants us to find him in the deepest way again and again. So he'll bring them back to the right focus. So verse 7, he says again, Thus says the Lord, consider your ways. He repeats it. I remember some years ago, we were in Stratford and Avon, and one of the statues there, of course, uh, honoring Shakespeare, had a quote from Henry V, and it's this one. Consideration, like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. Consideration is a very powerful thing. Consideration, like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. He says, consider your ways. Hold it. Consider me, look up, verse 8, and then he says, Go to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. And it's the same in the body of Christ, that God takes pleasure. What wonderful words. That God takes pleasure and is glorified in the church, with the saints, with his people with spirit-filled believers who are reflecting Him, knowing Him, praising Him, revealing Him, worshipping Him. Faith pleases Him, Hebrews 11.6. He takes pleasure where we are gathered and believing Him. He says, go to the mountains, take steps of faith, have a game plan follow through. Certain things will never happen in our life without a plan. Now there are problems and troubles that are a part of life. Don't take this and think, oh, we're struggling because there isn't faith or I'm not spiritual. That's not what we're saying. There are natural laws of of life that may have an effect on us. There can be demonic opposition in a believer's life who who is right on with God. But the principle, nevertheless, is also true that there can be times when God's hand is in my life and it's time to consider his ways. 
Someone might say, oh, I, I'm struggling so much in my life. I, I don't ever seem to be able to get there in whatever area. And, and you know, I, I, I don't seem to be hearing God and I pray, but, I, you know, and I'm working and I left this job and I'm struggling, my family, and ah! And you say, okay, well, uh, when was the last time you made a step of faith? Oh. When was the last time you went to church? Oh. When was the last, you know, it's like, okay, consider your ways. With all the strife, maybe take a few steps back. Then he repeats the principle in verse 9 through 11. He says, you look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. <laughs> it's quite, quite a graphic image. Here it is, you brought it home. <gasps> look, look, darling, look what I have. And God's like, <laughs> oh. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house... Because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I have called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, and whatever the ground brings forth on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Wow, that's quite something. It's a divine principle. Now listen. To this, it's wonderfully insightful. It's the other side of Matthew 6.33. Remember the passage in Matthew 6. We don't have it on the screen, but I'll read it to you. From verse 19, Jesus speaking says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in and steal. Matthew 6.25, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to his stature? It's a great question, isn't it? What what fruit does worrying have in our life? We should trade that energy for faith. Look to God. Verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. There's another time that word, consider. Consider your ways, consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, or you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, Do not worry what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall wear. For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Or your Father knows what you need. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. You see, what we're reading in Haggai 1 is the other side of this principle. If you are seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, there is a promise that these things will be added to you, that God can be your provider. Perhaps there was a family in Jerusalem at the time thinking, boy, we've been back here these 16, 17 years, and what is happening We came back by faith. We were doing so well in Babylon. And we made this decision to come back to Jerusalem and we're out in the fields every day. And look, what is happening? They look to the husband and he's like, 
And then there's a voice in the background. An old prophet. Consider your ways. Oh, and then the Spirit of God starts to do something. Seek first the kingdom. This is our calling, our privilege as his children. He is our father. We are his children. And he is sharing a secret with us. Listen. It's all about priority. It's all about an expression of faith. It doesn't mean we don't have a practical stewardship as fathers and husbands and citizens. Of course we do. But we are not striving or worrying. We are resting and trusting and seeing the faithful hand of God in our lives. We are here for an eternal purpose. We have a calling, a high calling. We can easily lose sight, and God wants to refresh us again and again. I remember times in my life, perhaps you do too, when it got a bit foggy, and you lost sight, and you got distracted, and you're involved in whatever this project or your work and all of it. Before you know it, know it you, you're, <clears throat> you're caught up in it. And God faithfully in his time, or perhaps in your time, our time, God faithfully is knocking and speaking and drawing and he brings us back. And there is such a refreshing in that place. And I say, oh gosh, I, I lost sight. I was still a Christian and I was still going to church, but I lost something. I lost the living faith or something. And then how simple life can unfold when that is right in the center. And look here, we'll bring this to a close. Look at verse 12. Here we see the response of the people. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadok, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Oh, this is wonderful. We see the response of the heart, starting again with Zerubbabel, and then Joshua, and then, of course, the people. God saying, listen, you take care of my house, I'll take care of yours. You seek first the kingdom, and I will add, I will bless, I will provide. I have promised. I am a faithful God. And I was young, and now I am old, the psalmist said. And I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor begging for bread. You know that verse? Perhaps many of us have memorized that verse. I was young, and now I'm old. Let's just say older. I was young and now I'm older. I have not seen the righteous begging for bread or forsaken. What is that saying? My testimony as an older believer is that God is faithful. I have seen it and I have experienced it. I put a little in his hand and he put so much in mine. So they respond. It says they, they respond. There we see here faith. Not, they're not rationalizing. They're not waiting. They're not defending. They're not procrastinating. They're not justifying. They say, yes, amen, thank you. We see it. And they, Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two walk together unless they are agreed Verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And this is the crown of it all. You know, Haggai is like, okay, please turn in your Bible. Here is the next message. Here it is. God is with you. That's the name of our message this morning. God is with you. And this is what he says to them. God is with you, says the Lord. Not only do you have this high, holy calling and this privilege to allow your hands to be 
used by God and your hearts to be blessed by God. But here is the, the qualifying privilege of it all. That God is with you. This is what stirred and turned the hearts of the people. That their covenant God, their loving God, the one who had promised, who had brought them back, said, listen, I am with you. This is your secret. This is the greatest promise, the greatest words, the greatest truth that we could ever embrace as believers, that God is with us. Verse 14, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. Notice, the Lord stirred the heart of Zerubbabel. The Lord stirred the heart of Joshua. The Lord stirred the heart of the people. It was a work of God. Not wishful thinking or willpower or a New Year's resolution or a decision on the... But God, a work of God starting and ending with, with God. And this wonderful story, as we will see, concludes with the rebuilding of the temple to the glory of God and him finding pleasure therein. And this is our wonderful privilege and calling as New Testament believers to recognize that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that there is a work in our life, that he finds pleasure in us and through us, and also corporately the work that God has called us to with our hands to the plow uh, by his grace. So, Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for these words and thoughts. We thank you for the opportunity to consider our ways and just afresh to look to you. Thank you that how through the word and by your spirit, you quicken our hearts. You cause us again and again to look up, to look to you, to look in faith. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit in us, for conviction, for your leading, for your voice in our life. And we believe you, God, that as we seek first the kingdom and your righteousness, that you are a faithful God, that you will add, you will provide. We will sense a blessing gently resting on our life. We confess that, we have experienced that, and we believe that looking forward. We pray for that, for each person here, for each family represented here and the extended families here. Oh God, we pray for uh, an overflow of blessings in our life and to others. And perhaps there's someone here this morning or listening online, you are not sure of your salvation. Oh, Jesus is the Savior. This is at the very heart of the gospel, that he loves you and he died for you on the cross and he paid for your sin. And it's so simple that there is a gift offered to you and receive it today by faith and say in your hearts, Oh God, I receive Jesus today. I receive the free gift of salvation and thank you for saving me today by grace through faith. And for all of us here, we pray that you would increase our faith, our understanding, give us abundant joy unspeakable, peace that passes understanding and a sense of your blessing on our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's have the...